If you're really serious about taking responsibility for your health, then you're really going to enjoy this episode as I talk with health coach and founder of Gene Life, Nick Eggleton. Nick has a very experienced background in advertising and marketing, but it was when he started to take his own health more seriously did he begin to truly understand the role that his industry had played in selling and shaping less than healthy beliefs and behaviours, something that by his own admission left him very angry. It was this that was the catalyst behind him beginning his health coaching business, Gene Life, whose mission is to help you to optimise your gene expression through nutrition, exercise and lifestyle. We cover a whole range of topics, epigenetics, how to switch on and off your genes, stresses, diet, sleep again, and a whole lot more. Nick is a seriously well-researched and well-read individual that's bursting at the seams with knowledge. And the further the conversation goes on, the more his energy levels go up, along with the fascinating golden nuggets that he shares. You can just tell how much this means to him. While this is a very informative conversation, it's also confronting. The conversation forces you to consider seriously your own health and habits, not just for today, but for the future. So enjoy, Nick. Hello and welcome back to WA Real. I'm your host, Bryn Edwards. Diet, nutrition, and transitioning from one career to another later in life, and the rich source of challenges that that brings, are just some of the things that we'll dive into today with my guest, Nick Eggleton. Nick. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Bryn. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Um, so one of the first questions I like to ask my guest is about how they end up in Western Australia. Um, so you came here in 2014 yep. from England, yep. which people all pick up as soon as I let you start talking. Aye, happen. Aye, up in York. How did you end up here? Um... Well, it's a long story, and it goes back to 2003 when I met my now wife, Jane. Um, She'd already applied for PR, um, and she was coming to Perth. And uh, but she gave me a chance, and so we ended up having a relationship back in the UK for uh, seven, eight, ten years, and eventually it came to the point where. I was in a place where I was happy to move to where she wanted to be. Mm. Um, I reckon I, wherever that could, there are pints to be pulled, I could pull pints. So, you know, even if I had to sell my business and start again doing something that I wasn't trained to do, I could probably turn my hand to something. Right. But why Perth? Well, you have to ask Jane that, to be honest. All right. I, um, she travelled around Australia. Her, her view is that Perth is the most Australian place in Australia. It's right. like when you, when you come from the UK and you visit Europe and you go to Melbourne or Sydney and to a certain extent Brisbane, they're, they're quite cosmopolitan, they're quite European style cities whereas mm. back in 1999 when she came here, when she first came here, it was very much you know spread out like LA in terms of density so it was, it was very low density. And she just, and the beaches, you know, I mean, these are the best beaches in the world. Mm. Um, She fell in love with the whole idea of living here. She came to work here. She worked here a couple of times on working holiday visas and then went back and went, that's it. She's from Manchester. It's like the the environmental difference between rainy Manchester and sunny sunny Perth is at at the extremes. Mm. Um, So yeah, uh, we are, she's an environmental immigrant. (laughs) <laughs> right. An environmental refugee. What do you enjoy about it? Um, Having been here now for a little while. Uh, just the pace of life, the people, um, the opportunities, the environment, the diversity. Uh, it's it's a city that's, I think it's a city that's grown up very quickly. I, I, like, to, I like to think of it as a teenager. Mm. So it's like a teenager of, of cities. It's kind of, it's got past the the, the awkward stage, but it, every now and again it trips over its own feet. You know, it's yeah. like just trying to grow into being a huge metropolitan city. Bear in mind the growth it's had over the last 15, 20 years. It's, but it's such an exciting place because everyone has this kind of pioneering spirit that they'll try things out. Yes. Know, this kind of gold there's gold in them, there hills kind of thing. It's like, yeah, we'll try that. We'll put some money in there. We'll see what's coming out, um, particularly if it is gold. Hmm. 
I was, I was thinking about this because as I was thinking about your story, there's a lot of similarities between yourself and myself mm -hmm. and, and particularly you come here doing one thing and now you find yourself doing another. Um, I'm, I'm doing another thing now. I didn't, I'm, I'm doing another thing now. So I had my own marketing agency in the UK and when I came out, I'd be, luckily I'd been offered a job to run under the marketing agency. Um, that didn't work out, so I started my own marketing agency because I've done that before. And I just, mm. after working for yourself for 13 of the last 15 years, it's like, it's much, you know, you know how it works. But then working in advertising and marketing, selling other people's dreams, other people's opportunities, other people's ambitions and visions is nice it's, it's it pays well it's really interesting the variety of subjects that you get involved in are fantastic but it's it's not my purpose mm. um and then and this journey i've been on from a health point of view has actually opened my eyes and it, it's actually the combination of coming from marketing and seeing health and marketing linked in this way has actually made me angry and ashamed at the same time how so um, I'm angry because we as a Western developed society have, uh, are crippling ourselves with sickness and it's, it's industrialization of our food industries, our agriculture and, and healthcare and pharmaceuticals through marketing, through marketing techniques. We've got this, this whole, um, tobacco situation all over again with, foods that we shouldn't be eating, lifestyles that we shouldn't be emulating. Um, and which, whatever we're doing at the moment isn't working because we're just getting sicker and sicker as a society. We're, we're draining more and more of our resources into providing help for people with chronic disease and, and uh, terminal diseases. And it is, I'm, I'm, so I'm angry that I was fooled like everybody else and ashamed of the industry that I work in that that is in unethically prom promoting this kind of this this kind of nonsense so yeah so angry and ashamed you know i saw a great meme the other day says like r real friends won't let their friends eat margarine and, and that's why i decided to become a health coach mm. it's to help my friends and family even if it's just one person just just turn around their their trajectory for ill health Hmm. I find it interesting that you said, you know, for years you've worked in advertising marketing and you've always, and yet that's promoting other people's dreams. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, again, uh, I felt quite a resonance when we first met and I invited you to come on the podcast. And then when I thought more about your journey, you know, I, I became a business consultant and so I ended up, like I've said before, it's um, being a business consultant is the greatest non-choice of a career. It's, it's a real good stalling pattern until such time as I actually know what I want to do when I grow up, I'll be a business consultant because then I can help fix problems and all that sort of stuff for other people and learn all at the same time. But it's the same thing, isn't it? It's like you're fixing other people you're turning up and fixing other people's problems or you're promoting other people's dreams yeah. and it just gets to this point when you think fuck I want to do this for myself yeah, so there are, more, there, are, there are problems and there are important problems and I think the, the, great, the interesting thing about solving business problems from, a, from a, a creative point of view is I can help hey, I've got some great ideas mm. we can do this um, from but that it's previous fr background. Fr from that previous background, but that's just inherently in me. I'm I am a problem solver. I am a creative. I am uh, I'm an I ideas person. But solving big, big, other people's business problems wasn't as wasn't as close to my heart as solving my health problems mm. and my risks and my family's risks. They're much more personal, much more intimate problems that I really want to help solve. Before the health thing became such a key issue and brought about this anger and, mm. and, and passion, etc., could you see yourself just being a, a advertising marketing creative? Was, was that you? Yeah, that's where you were going. That's I where mean, your identity. The, the blinkers, lies. the blinkers were on. 
Yeah, I mean, I like. How do you mean I, by the blinkers are on? Well, the blinkers are on is like this is what I do. I help people with their marketing, and that's how I identified. <coughs> I'm, an ad, I'm an ad man. Um, we do, you know, we help people solve marketing business problems. But it was, but it was the health journey and the information that that took the blinkers off. And it was like actually, there's a bigger problem that I can help with than this guy's or these people's business, which is helping people turn the health around. Mm. Um, can take these superpowers and use them for good. Yeah, I think what makes a great ad man and what, what I hope will make a great health coach, um, and this is definitely the feedback I'm getting, is empathy. Mm. Um, putting yourself in other people's shoes. So from an advertising point of view, our job in the agency is to represent the consumer, to see things from the consumer point of view and to create um, to create messages and uh, and sales opportunity, sales techniques that resonate with the potential target audience. But empathy is at the, is at the heart of it because if you don't care about your target audience, then you can't really mm. um, seduce the target audience. But I think empathy is, the, is, is one of my superpowers. And I think that's why when I talk to people, I really, I, I really feel for their their current situation and their vision for their health and that's why that's why I think I can help because it's not judging it's not teaching it's literally it, it's being there to support them on the journey that they want the change that they want to make and, and carrying them along with it and I think is that there are some kind of similarities with mm. some coaching and consulting it's like because it's one of the things that I thought about when I when I decided to become a health coach is like what's a health coach what does society think of health coaches are people do I mean it's like people know what a doctor is people know what a physiotherapist is what does a health coach do how does a health coach help and it's like it's that kind of it's this like, it's very similar with the word consultant it's like mm, a consultant you've got some ideas do you actually do anything it's like yeah we can but there's a longer there's a longer history of consultants and consultancies in yes. our society in business to business. People are recognise what a consultant is, and in healthcare, people recognise what a consultant is. But what does a coach do? What does a health coach do? Mm. What does a primary or primal health coach do? That's an education job as part as much as anything. I think mm. it's always it's interesting. I, you always get to this point in life when you when it becomes apparent what you're really here to do, and then all of a sudden you look behind and go, "Crap! I've picked up all these awesome skills and yeah. tools, and there's always yeah, this yeah. incredible, mysterious serendipity about it." Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's a great book called A Prayer for Owen Meany by um, John Harris. No, anyway. Prefero in meaning it tells this story which is basically um, a destiny story it's like these two kids who had this thing that they did all their lives and then one moment it was required of them and they saved some people's lives and it was just like that kind of serendipity it was like they had the skills that were required at the time to solve the problem that needed to be solved at that point in at time. that point in time and until that point in time it, it was just kind of there but latent Mm. So, so that the the interest in science has always an interest in science has always been a part of me, an interest in people has always been a part of me. I've got science skills in terms of research. I've mm. got people skills in terms of messaging. So when it came to health, it was just like here's another subject, but one that really matters. Yeah, it's almost as if you were being primed. Probably, yeah, and, and it was only because of the journey that I went on, started maybe three years ago with my health, you know, mm. um, 118 kilos, um, snoring every night, bad skin, irritable, grumpy, lack of energy, kind of lack of focus, you know, in terms of being able to concentrate on much for very long. Mm. Um, and then I went... I think I described to you. I went down a bit of a rabbit hole in terms of, oh, this is interesting. Well, this is oh, and what? I, and if I do that, this will happen. And tell me about the day when you decided enough was enough. So you said for yourself, you were what, 118 kilos. Yeah. I had a 
look on your website and I saw the before and after and yeah, yeah. you look like a right fat bloater before. Yeah, I, I, yeah that, that's I, I, that's 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 chubby Nick. Yeah, chubby Nick. And that was uh, that was 2017. Uh, we were at the Polo um, Polo in the city, mm. and um, I, I didn't think I looked that big then. I, we just got back from um, a week in Las Vegas, which was we, we got married in June 2016. Um, and then in 2000, late 2016, um, we went to Las Vegas for a friend's wedding. And then the weight started to pile on again. And it was just, it, I'd, I'd lost, I'd gone down from two eight, from 118 to 110. And then from 110 down to 17. And I was like really scraping the barrel to get any more off. And then I went back up to 112. And it was that yo-yoing that mm. most people who diet in inverted commas, yeah. They experience it's like once the diet stops, once the focus stops, uh, and then um, on top of what I was doing to get to lose five or ten kilos, I started intermittent fasting, and it was the intermittent fasting and how that really, really catalyzed the weight loss. Right. Um, that really I started to see the benefits, and now the health benefits are just I feel them every day you know I run up the stairs two at a time at the train station just because mm. I, because I'm lighter I mean I've, I've lost 38 kilos it's like you know that's carrying a small teenager on your shoulders every day up and down yeah. the stairs nobody, nobody runs upstairs with a teenager on their back but now I can so I do and that's just one element of this reprogramming the way that I live how did you um, at that point how did you view yourself? How did you before? Yeah, before way of life, um, jolly, jolly. Yeah, life and soul. Love to drink, love to eat. Yeah, socialise. Um, but lacked energy in the afternoon. Mm. Lacked energy at the weekends. Always catching up on sleep because I snored a lot. Jane was pretty much sleeping in a different room every night of the week. Um, it was hard. It was hard emotionally for us. It was it, why because you were well, we weren't sleeping. Sleep, in yeah, we weren't sleeping in the same bed. You know, it, it was just impossible for her to get a good night's sleep because I, I, sat, I was like a steam train. Yeah, and, did, you, and, did, did you just like go? Oh, well, that's just like I am at the moment. Or? But, yeah, and it was. I was on the verge of getting one of those CPAP machines. Mm. Um, being, I, you know, I'd been to a sleep clinic and I didn't have sleep apnea. Which, thank goodness so my heart wasn't in any danger but it worried her if I stopped breathing for a second you know mm. so it wasn't just the snoring it was the is he breathing you know, it was that kind of thing did you do much exercise at that point? no no I, I, and, I, and I still don't do much exercise right I, you, uh, you can't the, 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 the trigger for me was reading a book called The 4 Hour Body by Tim Ferriss Right. And in the four hour body, Tim talks about minimum effective dose. And the minimum effective dose principle is the 80 20 principle, which is 80% of the benefit will come from 20% of the effort. And being inherently like efficient or lazy, mm. it's like, what? So, so, so if you don't eat too many calories, then you don't store too many calories. And it, and it was like, so how much exercise do you have to do to burn off that Snickers bar? And it's quite a lot. You can have a donut or a pork pie or a sausage roll or a plate of pasta. There's a, there's a lot of energy there that needs to be burned or it'll be stored. But if you don't eat it in the first place, then you're not going to store it. And it was that, well, it's easier to not eat as much than it mm. is to go to the gym and try and kill myself through cardio exercise that yeah. that raises your stress stress levels that is actually um, prevents um, weight loss and it was the, all of that kind of the scientific the science of low carbs or carbohydrates and I mean I I, never, I, I didn't realize that you know carbohydrates are sugar. Mm just in another form, in another name, and it raises glucose in the body, and if you don't use the glucose, you store it as fat. And I was like, I didn't know that. Nobody told me that. There's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. We don't need carbohydrates. They're nice, they provide bursts of energy, they're, hmm. they're like a little kickstarter, a little, a little electric battery, 
but actually from a long-term health point of view from a from an efficient use of energy point of view they're quite inefficient yeah and it was all of that realization that actually so i can lose weight if i just eat less and eat particularly eat less carbohydrates um, and then it went it just snowballed from there into that was in, the, that into was the in, into into yeah into it, that was the gateway it and into the whole op, optimizing genetic expression uh, i know that that's what, that's what, what yeah, yeah so that's what piqued your interest yes so the, so um i read a, I, i've read a lot of books um and i know it's not you it, before i went to before i went to uh, before i did the course on health coaching and um, it, one thing that kept coming back was the effect on the the way that the long term way that your body reacts is because of the way that the things that you do, the stressors that your body is assaulted with, impact your DNA's expression. And I was trying to okay, so I was tr so I was yeah. trying to, th and I was thinking this question is going to come up. How do I? provide an analogy that people might understand and it's like this DNA is like the blueprint hmm. and the blueprint is modifiable so let's say it's a blue the blue the, the blueprint is a blueprint for a bridge hmm. and we so so the human body is like a bridge and, hmm. a, and the bridge is designed to carry traffic and if that if that traffic is the everyday assaults so that's Things that you eat, things that you feel, things that you breathe. So any kind of environmental lifestyle thought uh, is, is the traffic. And the bridge is designed to hold an amount of traffic. This blueprint is designed to hold that stress. Yes. And the odd big truck can rumble over. Yeah, the odd acute piece of stress can rumble over. And the bridge kind of adapts and, sh and repairs itself and restores itself. And it's still the bridge, and it can carry everyday stresses. And the problem is in society these days, it's not just one big truck. There's lots and lots of big trucks going on, both from what we eat, to what we breathe, to what we put on our skin, to how we're pressured by society to, to, to act, you know, the lack of sleep, the amount of stress, the amount of social isolation, these are all stresses mm. on, on this bridge, on yes. this human body. And that acute stress is manageable, but a chronic stress, systemic stress is not. Continued uh, It's continual, going over continual big trucks going over. In fact, some of these stresses are earthquakes. Mm. And so that blueprint was designed for little cars to go over at a certain volume and take the odd truck. It's not designed. Mm. And then what happens is the bridge starts to falter. Some of the columns start to weaken, and the DNA is there to tell us what the blue, how the blue, how the bridge should look. But the what's happened is at an epigenetic level, we've changed how that those genes are expressed. Mm. And so epigenetics is the stuff above DNA. Epi yeah. meaning above genetics, and it's the stuff on top of the DNA. It's the way that our DNA is methylated and, and um, some of the DNA is methylated. That is how genes are then expressed, whether they're turned on or turned off. So we turn on a strengthening of the bridge leg or we turn off a strengthening of the bridge leg. And these, this is, so th these stressors make the bridge unstable or help us to restore the bridge's strength and how it was meant to be. And we can... So optimal gene expression is basically saying that everything we do should be to reduce the amount of stress that we put onto the blueprint. And if we don't do that, then that can actually transfer generationally. So mums and dads can pass on to fourth, a fourth generation beyond their grandchildren. They can pass on these epigenetic effects, these stressors, whether those are toxins or whether it's nutrition or whether that's you know, just thoughts, anxiety, depression, etc., these things are transferable through generations of people. So that's part of what epigenetics is. So you're saying you can actually the blueprint changes. switch on and off genes? Yes. You can consciously do that? You can switch on and switch off genes. And um, so, yeah, so if we talk about hair, for example, mm. 
This is a really, uh, it's, it's a really good example. Hair, people think that um, hair loss in men is genetic. Right. Um, but it's, it's not genetic in, in, in 99% of cases. It's a genetic predisposition to these environmental stressors. Now, those environmental stressors might be nutrition or toxins or thoughts. Um, so you, you turn on the, um, the genetic expression for alopecia, which is basically the, um, the, uh, the, the blood flow to the hair follicle is inflamed. And the inflammation is, due, is caused by a genetic predisposition to an, a, an toxin. Yeah. So you, tur- so you are turning that on. Whether you turn it on pro- uh, consciously or subconsciously, it, it, it doesn't really matter. It's been turned on or it's been turned off. Yes. And so epigenetics or, or optimal gene expression is the idea to do everything you can to turn off genes that should be turned off, like um, alope- like, uh, like like cell differentiation, or um, uh, let me think of another example, um, or, or to turn on genes that you want to turn on. So, so through nutrition and exercise and lifestyle choices and sleep and th- and th- the way that you think, you can turn on and turn off genes and how they express, and they might and and for the better. Right. So the idea of the primal blueprint is to is to optimize the genetic expression to be to be the best penguin you can be. To be the best. Uh, it's a Gary Vaynerchuk saying. It's like a, a penguin can't be a giraffe. It can just be the best penguin it can be. Yes. So it's like you see. So some people are built for strength. Mm. And some people are built for endurance. So you, you have a genetic blueprint that yes. is, um, so, and you, the idea is that you will maximise what's what the opportunity is for you. So you, in terms of lowering risks or raising um, longevity, the, the the overall outcome is a longer, healthier life. So most people these days, they as they age, they become more infirm. And they get more chronic diseases, and they they get a worse and worse um, quality of life. Mm. And so, optimal gene expression is about living a healthy, long life, and then suddenly passing away through know, a massive heart attack at 120 years old in your sleep. Because then you've lived a healthy, a health span, a, a quality life, and you know, we're all going to die. Um, but you've 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 maximized your exit strategy right this is interesting because i think for most of us genes seem to be a thing that just do things to us yeah and and it's kind of like well that's just that then that's right people uh, people believe that it's destiny it's predetermined Hmm. but it isn't it's a predisposition yeah Um, so by expressing your genes by turning off bad genes and by turning on good genes and so turning on good genes makes you know replaces cells, to you know, um, but re- replacing them with healthy cells, not mm. with damaged cells. You know, sunshine damages our DNA, but we it, we repair it. Um, certain foods that we eat will damage our DNA, but they but they strengthen through hormesis. They strengthen our ability to, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, you know, exercise is hormetic. You know, it, building muscle means we're breaking muscle down to repair muscle, and repairing muscle makes muscles bigger and stronger. Mm. That's that's how our genes are meant to work. Um, and that's interesting because one of the things I've been playing with of recent is the idea that you know we all we would all like to bring about train, change in our lives by retreating back to a very harmonious and peaceful state and set intentions there and then bring about change in that state. But more often than not, <clears throat> we bring about change in the crucible or the intensity of a full-on situation. And I just see a lot of uh, people wanting to go back to that karma state as opposed to embracing the crucible more. And that's a part of what you're talking about here. Is that right? 
I think just if you if you go back ancestrally, because mm. it, it, um, biology outside of evolution is 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 meaningless. You know, so from an evolutionary point of view, Homo sapiens and other hominids have been around two and a half three million years. So 97 percent of our existence on the planet was in small tribes, mm. in small communities with very, very strong kind of sense of support. Like the tribe succeeds if we all succeed. Um, and only in the last 10, 15,000 years of our civilization, or civilization in inverted commas, have we kind of broken away from that evolutionary, calm, survival, community kind of pre predisposition. That's what our genetics tell us to do. We live in much bigger societies. Um, we, we eat th foods that we had to grow in order to support those that aren't optimal. Hmm. Um, you can talk about that a little bit in terms of what kind of nutrition, but it's at, at, hmm. at, a, at a philosophical level. You know, this, this, this idea of re, redrawing the lines, going back to a more primal, tribal supportive um, uh, mutually assured success um, hopefully will will come about I think the fight or flight that comes from this crucible mm. is hormetic when it's acute so saber tooth tiger comes in to into the into the into the village we need to be able to run away or kill it but you know that shouldn't happen every day or every minute of every day. Mm. And I think the reason why a lot of people are trying to meditation and mindfulness these days is because of the always on nature. You know, every time your phone pings, every you know, every time the phone rings, every time somebody walks into your office, it's it's in a situation that is not how we used to, how our bodies, how our genes mm. are designed to work. You know, it's the the amount of you know. The amount, all of these metabolic syndromes, these diseases, modern diseases like um, cancers and dementia, cardiovascular disease, cere cerebrovascular disease, um, and uh, uh, diabetes and autoimmune issues—they're all they're all coming about because of our lack of our not being in touch with our ancestral selves, our, how we used to live yeah and they they're denying our we're not actually in connection with our body we're not we're not in connection with how we're meant to function hmm hmm so you read a lot of books read a lot of books listen to a lot of podcasts how did you convert that into action <laughs> And how did you then convert that into? So when I started the journey, I wrote this seventh. Uh, when I when I started the journey, I lost some weight, and people noticed, and they would say, "You lost a bit of weight. How did you do that?" And I'd bore people to death for half an hour, or as long as I, as, as long <laughs> until their eyes glazed over, and I say, "I think I'll stop now." Yeah, because the amount of information can be really overwhelming. Drinking from a firehouse. Absolutely, and. So, I, so I'm going to write this down so that I can mm. point people in the direction. And I started to write a blog and it got to 7,000 words and I thought I better publish this otherwise I'm never going to stop because every day I was learning something new and every day was going to be further and further from people actually taking any notice of it. I didn't, it wasn't, there was no, there was no book that I needed to raise. It's like, look, I need to put this down, I need to explain this, and then I need to reference it so that people can actually check out the references and it is scientific, the thing that I'm talking about. Yeah. And I wrote this thing down and I introduced it to my friends and family and I said, look, you know, going on a journey, being on a journey, carrying on on this journey, I think you'll benefit. If, even if you don't benefit, maybe your children will benefit. If you just learn, you know, if you just pick a few of these things up, you can use it as a reference, dip in, dip out. And, um, and, a, and a quite a few people who read it said, wow, that was really informative. I thought X for a long time or Y for a long time. Mm. And now you've kind of put it into a, into a shape which actually kind of makes some sense. And then uh, because, because throughout my career as a, 
an advertising guy, or at least the last 15 years, I've, I've really enjoyed mentoring people. So I've had lots of interns come through the agency. And I've always, and they've always really benefited from the mentoring, like cutting through the crap. So yeah. be, you know, like, this is what you need to pay attention to, ignore that, that's fluffed mm. in it. And my wife said, you'd make a great health coach. And I'm like, yeah, what, what, what's a health? It's like, you know, helping other people, not just writing a blog and telling your friends and family it's there, go and read it. Mm. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, well, maybe one day you know, I, I could help people. Yeah. And then uh, she wrote an email to Mark Sisson, the guy who wrote the Primal Blueprint. And she said, Nick's, he's, 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 he's procrastinating. He's so passionate about this. He needs a kick up the bum. So Mark Sisson then emailed me and mm. said, and said, you know, Mark Sisson is the guy who wrote the Primal Blueprint. Yeah. Um, and he is a legend. He's quite a character, isn't he? He's quite a character. He's 65 years old and he's ripped like an MMA fighter. Paddle boards every day, goes for long walks, long hikes with his wife. He eats, you know, he's been on numerous documentaries about, you know, um, the primal way of life. He built up a, he's built up a number of businesses over the past, but he's, he's just sold a business to Kraft. And it's a primal, uh, it's called Primal Kitchen, and it basically it's mayonnaise and tomato ketchups in America, mm. m- mainly, but also supplements. Um, and he's, he's, he, he's, he started out writing this blog called Mark's Daily Apple. Yeah. And he started with like 100 people, and then it was 1,000, and he was like, well, the aim is to get to 10,000 people. So he got to 10,000 people, and he's like, how do I get to a million people? And um, one of the things was to like to make more Mark Sissons. So he, he started this thing called the Primal Health Coach Institute to train people to do to 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 make more like advocates, ambassadors. Spread the message, yeah, yeah, spread the message. Become so. Um, so uh, he wrote to me and said, "What have you got to lose?" And I was like, "Nothing really. I can still." run an advertising agency and do the, the training in my spare time. I've got hours in the day. It's 18 hours in a day if you don't sleep enough. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give this a crack. And so I literally, uh, I, I started the course and finished the course in record time and decided that... Is that because um, you devoured it? Yeah, dev- well, yeah, I did. Because the course was part nutrition, a lot of which I already knew, um, part business, and most of that was marketing, which I kind of, you know, like, if I don't get 100% on this exam, I'm going to be really annoyed. <laughs> and, I, and I did get 100%. Um, uh, but the coaching thing was new to me. So mm. it's like, so I, I like to sit and talk to people and talk at people and tell them what they need to know. But that's not what coaching's about. That's, no. not, that's, that's not how a coach helps people. They have to change. They have to want to change. They, um, so the coaching thing has been interesting. So... Again, superpower, empathy, listening, not judging, asking the right questions. That's hopefully what where people will come. They will find the answers themselves and, and give themselves the action steps and give themselves the... They, they will look to, for the support, not a headmaster. Yes. Um, so, so that's why I thought, yeah, I can do that. And it's a, a new skill coaching. So again, there was, there was part of it was kind of new. It's like, oh, so I'm learning a new skill. And, and actually, you know, I really enjoy, still really enjoy the marketing side of the business. And that's, the, you know, where the majority of the revenues come from at the moment. But now the idea with the, um, the coaching business is to help people like me who are middle-aged, slightly overweight, wrong side of 40 guys who are, uh, who are on a trajectory to ill health, on a trajectory, right. the same trajectory I was, which is, you know, um, there's already we know that, that by the time by the time people my age are 85, there's a 50 50 chance they'll have some form of Alzheimer's or, or dementia. Right. It's, it's the number one killer of women already in Australia and the number two killer of men mm. after cardiovascular disease. Um, so dementia, autoimmune issues, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, strokes. Those are, the, those are all lifestyle diseases. Yeah. That I want to help people who don't want to get there. So if I talk to a business guy about exit strategy, he understands that because his business will have an exit, an exit strategy. strategy. 
But how do you want to? How do you want to exit? Is is the question that I was mm. asking myself. How do I? Do I want to be? Do I want to have dementia by the time I'm eighty? That's only like 20, 20 years ago. Twenty years ago, or twenty. It's like twenty years time. Do I want to be like not as cognitively, mm. you know, switched on as I am? It's like I, I don't want to wait until I'm eighty to take the risk. That's a risk that I'm not prepared. So, so I needed to change my habits. So, so effectively what the coaching is, is about providing the right kind of information, but, but helping support people to change their habits mm. to, for the long-term benefit over the short-term reward. Um, and so that's, the, so that's where we're aiming the business, is mm. aiming at people like me who can relate to business strategies and health strategies, who understand that kind of language, that kind of reverse engineering outcomes. You know? mm. um, that's how I think, that's where I think, I feel that I'll have most relatable ideas. Not to say that, you know, if, uh, if non-business people or people of, you know, uh, of, uh, of, of other ages um, aren't interested that, you know, I wouldn't welcome them with open arms. But I think as, as, as we get into our mid thirties, in business, we've got an eye on a different prize than we have when we get to 45 and when you get to my age at 55, is like, hang on a second, um, I should be winding down now, I don't want to wind down, I, I'm really enjoying myself. And if I did wind down, what would be the consequences of mm. that winding down? You know, would I become cognitively impaired? Would I become less fit? Um, and it's the, I think it's the this post middle age kind of um, ideas like you start to think about mortality and and it's like when because when you're mid thirties you're immortal when when, you, when I talk to twenty odd year olds about you know eating bread or and it's like they're looking at me it's like say it's not making me ill it's like no not yet um, so it's not as in front of them they're not as motivated yeah. to want to change whereas people I think people I hope people my age do start to think about their mortality and do start to think about how they want to live the next 30, 40, 50 years. Yes. Because there's no reason why you couldn't at 50 live another 50 years. Uh, absolutely no reason at all. But do you want to leave, live the last 20 of them in a nursing home with somebody wiping your bum? Yeah, and you're not really being there. Well, not really being there and forgetting your family, you know. And do you want that for your kids and your kids' kids? And I don't want that for my kids. Hmm. Um, and I don't want that for their kids either. As you started to do, <clears throat> as you, you know, took up the challenge from Mark Sisson and his email and started to do the training, how did you reconcile the fact that you, know, you spent X amount of time building up Nick as the advertising person and now you're about to go somewhere else and that sunk loss sorry sunk loss it, uh, I'd invest it's in a big that transition in identity yeah but but that investment in my so I've been continuously sharpening the saw learning the trade never thought I knew it all always wanted to be in, in, on, in marketing yeah on top of the latest digital tools and techniques <clears throat> and still am Still fascinated by technology and and how it impacts messaging and, and consumers and society, but that investment will will not provide as much of a return as the investment that I'm making in my health and in my friends and family's health. Mm. So so I I've lost that investment. It, I say I lost it. I, it's there's still a return on. There is still a return on that investment, hmm. but it's not as great as the impact it's the investment. It's a lesser investment. Yeah, it, so it's so I can't. It, it's like, you know, um, I'm going to dive out of this plane. There's no point in me looking back at the plane and thinking, I wish I still had a rope attached. You know, it's like that, that's. I guess that's part of my immigrant personality. My my, my family's immigrant kind of work ethic is like. You, you can be what you are motivated to achieve. 
So uh, giving up, I'm not giving up marketing. I st- Please, if you're a client and you listen to this, don't think for a second that I'm, I'm closing Nick's the door. going to quietly no, close the door. No, because because but there will come a time when I'm doing instead of doing eighty percent marketing, twenty percent coaching, it'll be eighty percent health coaching and twenty percent marketing. Yeah. Because I think people will always want to turn to the grey beards in the room and say, so strategically speaking, how do you think we should approach this? That yeah. All the young kids know all the young tactics and you know. And, yeah, yeah, but the. But, but tactics is for strategy. Is the noise before defeat? As, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love that that's one of my I mean, I've got a lot of quotes that really resonate with me but the Sun Tzu tactics before strategy whenever I'm in a meeting it's like it's just tactics stop talking to me about tactics that's that you, that, that's they're self-defeating because you're just looking too short term correct and so strategically from a health point of view mm. we have to lay down some principles yes um, we have to lay down some principles and guidelines but then but the tactics will differ from person to person because mm. Genetically speaking, what's good for me isn't necessarily good for you. Mm. And uh, you know, and I think we we deny our ancestral ethnicity, our evolutionary polymorphisms, uh, our own, uh, uh, our you know, our own um, behest. It's like, it's like um, I, when I say to people, when I say to I say to an Indian friend, I said, "So, how long have potatoes and tomatoes been part of your diet?" Oh, for years and years, the family have always been cooking with tomatoes and chilies and potatoes and making curries. And it's like, okay, where, where do potatoes come from? The British introduced them in the 17th, 18th century, and they got them from where? Uh, oh, yeah. So Walter Raleigh in 1497 or something, you know, it was like, we've only been eating potatoes and tomatoes for 500 years. And in terms of an evolution, evolutionary terms, that is less than the blink of an eye. It's the thought of blinking your eye. Yes. 500 years we've been eating nightshades like cucumbers and potatoes and tomatoes and chilies as Westerners. But in South America, they've been eating corn and chili and tomatoes and avocados for tens of thousands of years. So they've evolutionarily developed enzymes and transgenerational epigenetical ways of modifying their their physiology it to their environment that's what evolution is it's the it's the ability to adapt to the conditions it's survival of the most adaptable mm. not necessarily the strongest so you look at you know my genetics if you look at 23 and me i've got um, oriental let's call it mongolian blood mm. um, so that tribe of people were nomads they were pushing sheep around, you know, following the pasture lands. They weren't growing wheat. And they weren't, you know, they, they, so they were nomads. And mm. so, so my diet um, is optimized when I'm eating the kind of foods that they used to eat. But if I eat tomatoes or peppers or uh, capsicums, sorry, or potatoes, it's like that, that's not what my family used to eat. Never. Yeah. Never in human history did they used to eat avocados. Not that avocados aren't nutritious, because they are, they're, they're bloody good for you. But um, it's just, it's like knowing where you come from, where your great, 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 great grandparents, what mm. they used to eat, how where they used to live. Yeah, it's really important to your genetic story. And you can optimize your genetic expression by, by paying truth, by, you know, by paying homage to it and not trying to force foods that are outside of that into your system just because because they're there mm. I think the first time I um, paused to think about this was at the age of 40 I de- when I turned 40 I decided to go and get um, just a blood, set of blood tests to see where I was at <clears throat> and strangely enough the, the sticky note that said ring doctor sat on the side of the desk for about 6 weeks and it was that close to going in the bin when I thought I oh, sod it, I'll just give him a ring. And so I did, and I booked the appointment, and I went in, and I went to see, oh, I went to see, I have a really, really good GP, and she's very, I didn't realise just how thorough and proactive her forward-thinking her view was until I sat and said, mm. I'll just turn 40, I thought it'd be prudent just to have a set of blood tests, see how I'm going. Mm. So next day went in, had all, all the vials taken out, about eight vials of blood, and that afternoon I got a phone call saying that my ferritin levels were off the charts high 
high. Okay. Iron. Yeah. So, you know, it's a range of 100 to 300, and mine was 1650. Yeah. Uh, I, I know what that is. <laughs> yeah. So that's genetic hemochromatosis. Correct. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I had a little freak out about that because you start reading about it, and it's, it's the sort of thing it doesn't kill you, but its effects can significantly shorten your life, particularly yep. getting to the age, latter 50s. Yep. So then I start. so once I get over that, uh, and, and the fact that I was yay close to checking that, checking that post-it note in the yeah, bin, yeah. Uh, then I realised that, so I've got a lot of blood taking in front of me, and so the, pretty much the whole of 2015, I was in having blood taken every week. What, a pint? A pint that's, a that's, week. That's an armful. That's an armful, <laughs> yes. And, and, you know, it took, um, I had a little log book, and it took 53 pints to get me. Wow. Um, down to a reasonable level and I have yeah. to go every 10 weeks now. Yeah. And, um, so it was a chronic I, accumulation of ferritin. Yeah, in... and I was only 40. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a whole lot of things around the, the reduction of the iron and the journey that I went through. But the reason why I tell you this is because in the middle of it, I was musing with, uh, with my phlebotomist, Beth, who's a lovely woman who I regularly saw. And she started talking about the fact that quite a few people who come from the Midlands or North England are prone to hemochromatosis and I asked why that is and she then linked it back even further to sort of Icelandic um, Viking Mm -hmm. type Mm -hmm. blood where iron was because there was a lot of fish and things like that there was a lot less iron Mm -hmm. in the diet and so they'd almost switched on this gene Mm -hmm. to extract and retain more iron out of your diet Mm -hmm in order to survive. And that's when I suddenly thought, holy crap, there's this thing which, on, on the start of it, at the start of me first finding out about it, could have finished my life earlier. Yep. However, it's played a key role in me actually even being here, in yeah. this yeah, yeah, yeah. body, in this yeah. entity. It's interesting you should mention um, that particular polymorphism, um, the, the iron one. So I have a friend who suffers from it as well, and she's of um, Irish Scandinavian extraction, hmm. and I was telling, I was talking to her about it. It's like the reason why, so one of the reasons why there could be a bioaccumulation is because of vitamin D. Um, because most people today are vitamin D deficient, and the darker your skin, the more sun you need to have to convert vitamin D into cholesterol. No, sorry, convert cholesterol into vitamin D. That's how, but, so the sun converts cholesterol in, the, in your subcutaneous tissue into vitamin D. And vitamin D is needed as part of lots of different processes within the body. And the lighter your skin, the less sun you require. But above a certain latitude, you can't get enough from just sunlight. So you have to take it from food. And fish is a really high source right. of vitamin D. Right. But it, but it also comes with heavy metals. Yes. So, yeah, it, it's, all, it's not just one thing. So it's like you say ferritin, but why was it there? You, why did the human body design itself so that it would accumulate iron unless it had a way of actually binding that iron and chelating it and getting it out of the system. So what is it about your lifestyle, mm. apart from not cutting yourself so you bleed a lot, what is it about your lifestyle that you're not getting? Because it's not a mutation. It's, it was designed in order to, for adapti- adaptive issues, but which you yes. no longer have. It's, you know, the, this, this, the, it's so interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting. Fascinating. That's just one you know, one metal in your body. Iron. Yeah. And we're, we're full of this stuff. Magnesium, sodium, potassium, you know, chromium, cadmium, you know, it's, Still it's all there. Some of it's really toxic. Yeah. yeah. Some of it's, you You know, you don't want uranium in or too much boron or certainly not any mercury. Yes. But, you know, we eat stuff that contains mercury. You know? Well, Tony Robbins, very oh, famous example. Very famous example. Yeah. Eating all the salmon because he was fueling, 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 and the amount of salmon that he ate ended up with the mercury. Tuna. 
Oh, tuna. It was yeah. tuna. And Sorry. what? So, yeah, so what happened with Tony was he suddenly ha- started to have debilitating episodes, cognitive impairment. Um, Which is pretty serious energy. for a dude like Tony. Yeah. Um, so suddenly remem- forgetting things. And he changed his diet. He, so he'd been a vegetarian for a long time, but he's, I think his new wife was a pescatarian. Mm. And so it's like, okay, I'll, I'll eat the tuna. Yeah. And tuna's a big fish. Mm. And the bigger the fish, the older the fish, the more small fish it's eaten. And so the more it has bioaccumulated mercury. And so what, because he'd been eating, and because he's a big guy, he needed a lot. He'd been eating a lot of tuna for protein, but it had also built up the amount of mercury. And he's, he's, he didn't have a... He didn't have a pathway for the mercury to leave his body quicker than he was accumulating mm. it and so that so he had to go to hyperbaric chambers and mm. certain um uh, certain foods that bind to the mercury mm. um, but yeah incredibly toxic so mm. yeah so it's one thing you can do, eat fish you don't eat tuna big tuna skipjack's different skipjack's a smaller fish um but don't eat big big old fish they're full of they're Stuff. full of toxins yeah mm. Tony's writing a health book around. I'm intrigued to see what, what comes out Interesting. of it. Interesting, yeah. Similar to his money masters. Anyway, back to you. So with Gene Life, which is the name of yep. your company, so what are the services that you actually offer? Do you know If I was to present to you, would I go and have a genetic test or something mm. at the start? We can make some assumptions. Mm. Um, so, so, so we do... Um, group coaching, one-on-one coaching, corporate wellness and workshops. Um, one-on-one coaching is the most intimate. Yep. Um, part of that process is a discovery call. So we have a quick interview on the phone. We see whether you really want to change. Do you really want to change? How much are you prepared to commit to changing? Because it's hard. You know, I said to suddenly turn around to you and say, you can only have a slice of bread once a week. And it's like, really? And it's like, yeah. It's like, but I love my bread. It's like, yeah, but alcoholics love alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> yeah, you yeah, need, so you know, so, uh, it, it's, so we have this conversation about like seeing whether there's a good match, seeing what the history is, seeing what the goals are. Mm. And again, it comes, you know, back from a business point of view, it's about, so what are the objectives? Mm. If it's general, I want to live a longer, healthier life. Great. If it's specific, I, you know, I've, I, I'm living with type two diabetes and I really want to get my blood sugar under control great Mm -hmm. if it's um if it's you know i'm overweight and i want to lose 20 kilos great yeah so we find out what the objectives are and whether that whether there are strategies that we can we can implement as part of a journey and that journey might be eight weeks 12 weeks six months depends on the the size of the objective the size Mm. um so that's how the one-on-one works. Group coaching is kind of a light version of that, done usually electronically by email and webinars and that kind of thing. The corporate wellness is lunch and learn. So I go into a business and I'll sit down with a team of people, 20, 30 people, and we'll do half an hour. It can be a one-off, it can be like a series. Yeah. Like, you know, we'll do Provoke nutrition, we'll do, we'll do you know, nutrition today. Like these are the foods you should avoid. These are the foods you should eat. Mm. This is the exercise you should do. This is the exercise you should avoid. These are the lifestyle choices. Um, we'll talk about sleep. I'll we'll talk about stress. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of those things. Um, so so that's that's what the program involves. That mm. those you know nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle. And within lifestyle, we'll talk about stress and sleep and play. Mm. Um, what was the second part of that question? Gene life and. I asked. Um, so that's the onboarding. So that's how, and that, that that's the kind of service we offer. Yeah, I actually asked. You know, would I be expected to go and do a genetic test of some description? Oh yeah. So no, it's optional. Right. I mean, there. Um, I guess if you if when you are writing a business strategy, the more research you have, the more information you have, the more the more insights that you can glean. So a genetic test is useful if you have one of these specific SNPs, these single uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms that it says you've got hemochromatosis. You, yeah. Yeah, it's like, right, we need to know that because there's no point in me it's recommending you eat too. liver three times a week. Yeah. Because the heme iron in there is just going to not do the right kind of things. Yeah. Um, so that kind of information is important. Um, but also, you know, blood tests, lipid panels, I mean, you, uh, if you went to see an, a naturopath, they'd probably do a stool test. 
you know, the more information that we have, the better. Mm. And we work with doctors, we work with naturopaths and functional medicine practitioners, chiropractors, you know, all part of this kind of allied health kind of team. Uh, but our job is to coach, yes. not to diagnose. So, right. so, so there's no diagnosis. I'm going to tell you, oh, by, just by looking at you and your blood test, you have X. That, that's not our job. Yeah, that's not our job. Our job is for you to say, so what do you think's wrong? And you say, I've got type two diabetes. And I say, oh, have you? Right, okay. And what are you doing about that? And you say, well, I'm not sure. And I'm like, well, I, so I can signpost things that you maybe need to be thinking about. Right. Do you think you can get so on with this? It's always like a triage. Yeah, it is a little. Yeah. yeah there is definitely at that at the beginning, but then we work out the plan. Right. Mm. Okay. The the priority here for you is, let's say, it's body composition. We're going to talk about diet. Mm. If the priority is um, stress we're going to talk about meditation and sleep now I think sleep is one of those things that again you know you, I don't, you never even think about sleep you just you just sleep unless you've got problems with sleep but sleep we spend a third of our lives asleep yeah you know it's the it's the time our bodies get to regenerate both from a physiological point of view and from a psychological point of view you know we um Everybody that's listening to this, that has a child, should buy a book called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a New York Times bestseller. It's a, it's a seminal piece of writing. There's a chapter in there on adolescence. And I know as an adolescent, I remember being an adolescent, needing to sleep. But yes. needing to sleep when I wasn't supposed to be sleeping. And in the book, Matthew Walker uses actual effects of moving sleep patterns. So adolescents change their circadian rhythm. They go to sleep later and they wake up later. And that's a natural evolutionary, evolutionary ideal. And it's the same with older people. They go to sleep later and they wake up early. It's because the tribe needed somebody to be awake at all times. So who are we gonna, we'll, put, we'll, we'll take these people and we'll say, you're going to stay up late and protect mm. the tribe with the older folk, right? And let the main warriors within the tribe and the families get some sleep, get some secure, sound sleep. And then we'll let you sleep in. But what do we do? We force kids up at six, five, six o'clock in the morning to get them off to school at 7.30. That'd be like saying to an adult, right, it's three o'clock now, you need to get up and go and do a shift. We, we are forcing children into our mm. time circadian rhythm. Yes. I mean, it's not natural for them. And it creates well, it, anxiety. Is our, it, it cre is our circadian rhythm even good for us, you know, we adults? Well, um, so you... Uh, um, no, mm. is, the, is, is the answer to that. Because, <laughs> we live, because we live an electronic life. Yeah. We should be going to sleep two hours after sundown. Because we wouldn't have been able... What would you do when it was dark? And then you'd wake up when it was light. And depending on where you are in the planet, that can be longer days, shorter days. And we should work with the seasons. We should work with the rhythms hmm. of, of sunlight. Um, we should be up in the morning bathing in that, that vitamin, bathing in the vitamin D that's available to us to prepare our melanin in our bodies to for the sun that's coming throughout the day. Not hiding away from it. Yes. Not not shirking that sun not getting enough vitamin d you know it's it's all this circadian we should eat to the circadian rhythm we should sleep to the circadian rhythm the sun is the biggest energy provider to all plants and the animals mm. um so yeah so if you buy that book read it and then let your kids sleep in i mean i dave asprey the bulletproof uh, yes. coffee guy he took his kids out of school because of that book basically he's homeschooling them it's like kids you sleep till you want to sleep and you stay up till you however you want to sleep. Yeah. Because, because it's damaging. Lack of sleep is another stress that we like. Well, I had a podcast guest pre, uh, a few weeks back, Paul Newson. He came back to, to, he's been on the podcast twice and he's had quite um, a debilitating um, injury. He's a swim coach, et cetera, et cetera. And he started to look at just his patterns behind just everyday performance and his sleep was the first thing and he, and he referenced um, Margaret Thatcher 
yeah. And Ronald I, Reagan. And Ronald Reagan, who, who could run the country on yeah. four hours of sleep. And then yeah. what happened to both of them? Alzheimer's. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and, and it was it's too simply a friend of his um, who was who was a coach suggested that he wore one of the Azor rings. Yeah, Aura ring. Aura rings, that's the one. Yeah. And um, yeah, suddenly he started to see his heart rate variability and his level of sleep and it was not where it should be. Yeah, what you measure, you can manage. Correct. So, so you go to a lot of, you know, being in bed for eight or nine hours sounds like a long time, but you're probably only asleep eight. I mean, yeah, if you're ill, you might sleep a little bit longer because the body needs a little bit longer to mm. sleep. But if you're going to bed at 11 o'clock and then getting up at five, like you've not had six hours sleep, you've had maybe five. And the quality of that sleep, you're not getting the, the, um, the correct amounts of REM and non-REM sleep that your body requires for mm. optimal gene expression. It's a massive stressor on, on genetic expression, on, on health. Mm. Um, and yes, yeah, so we should be... Yeah, we should be getting rid of the all of the electronic light, especially blue light, especially our TVs and our phones and our laptops and our iPads earlier. And that brings on what's called um, delayed onset melanin. Melatonin. Melatonin, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, dims. Anyway, so it's to do it, so it brings on melato yeah. melatonin, and that's what helps you sleep. Yes. So, and you, you, you want that you want that overwhelming right crash it's nine o'clock now I'm ready for bed yeah. and then when you wake up at six you're like wow that was a good night's sleep yeah I know I mean I was on a three hour zoom call last night till ten o'clock now the content of it was pretty awesome it was with Carlo a previous podcast guest um, but I also know the blue light had a big effect so I lie in bed yep yeah. uh, yep yeah. I've got all the stimulation of yeah, the call you, with your Carl. Body, your body thinks it's got, the middle of the day. And yeah. In fact, one of the guys on the call was actually wearing the gla glasses. The yellow glasses. Yellow glasses. <clears throat> and I have a pair and I'm going to have to dig them out. Yeah. Yeah, so those yellow glasses, yellow lights. We live in a fluorescent world these days. We've just got too much blue light and it, it just upsets our circadian rhythm. That's why we can't go to sleep. Well. Yeah. So that's one of the first questions I'll, I'll ask a client is, so how's your sleep? Hmm. It's like it's, it's fine. So, uh, how much are you? When do you watch your sleep routine? And we talk about it, and it's like invariably they're not getting enough sleep. Yeah. Unless they're already primarily switched on, like you know people like Carl and Paul um, and yourself. It's like unless you, unless you're aware of the impact that chronic sleep deprivation, and that just needs to be half an hour or an hour a night. That's chronic if it's every night. Yes, because you can't catch it up. It's not you can't bank it. You can't say, "Oh, I'm up early every night and then I'll sleep in at the weekend." You'll never get that sleep back. Yeah. You'll never get the benefits psychologically and physiologically of of the REM and the non-REM sleep that you'll get. Anyway, mm. recommend that book. That's that's first because that's what you do for a third of your life is sleep. Yeah. So if you can fix sleep, you do, you've made a massive leap towards optimal gene expression. Wow. Food, sleep. And some exercise. And some exercise. The right kind of exercise. What does right kind of exercise mean? Not chronic exercise. As in? A, a lot of people go and kill themselves in the gym. They'll go, they'll go spend two or three hours there three or four times a week. They'll, they'll go over them, um, their natural uh, heart rate for, uh, for fat burning. Mm. And they'll, their, their bodies will elevate cortisol. Cortisol will, is basically a, um, a catabolic um, hormone, mm. uh, which will actually um, deplete them of the, uh, deplete their, their their muscle gains. So, but so it's that it's that fight or flight. So chronic exercise is a killer. You know, it's like over exercising. It's mm. like you, you don't need to do that to get the benefits. There's lots of endurance athletes who train um, less for less amounts because they, is it little worry is it little wonder then that quite a lot of our you know. Uh, athletes that we put on a pedestal often later on we find out that they've got mental health issues and physical in, and in physical. amongst the whole well it's inflammatory supreme it's inflammatory right. and it's inflammation that causes heart disease it's, inf mm. it's inflammation that causes cerebrovascular disease it's inflammation that causes um, a lot of the you know a, lo a lot of these a lot of these metabolic diseases 
So if you have elevated cortisol, hypercortisolemia, you are shutting down lipolysis, you are insulin resistant, you are reduced, if you are high in cortisol, you're low in testosterone, you are basically being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. And all day, every day. All day, every day. So, so what we, within the primal health coaching world, we talk about movement, primal movement. We talk about lifting heavy things. Every day should be a leg day. Because it's your le- the stability and strength of your legs that will carry you to till you're 95, 105. Mm. If you don't have good legs, good, strong, stable legs that come from lifting things, you, you need that muscle hypertrophy, that tone yeah. in those muscles. So we lift heavy things. Ties and glutes. We walk a lot, because that's what we did ancestrally. We would walk for miles pretty much every day, but we would never get above a certain heart rate, because we wouldn't be able to endure that kind of stress on the body. So there's, there's an optimal heart rate kind of target, depending on your age. And then occasional sprints. Yeah, you need to be prepared for that tiger or for that other tribesman or to run after that injured gazelle that you've caught with an arrow that's going to get away from you. But brief spurts of energy, not running on a treadmill for two hours, six days a week. That's not what our bodies were designed to do. Yeah. Not unless you're an Ethiopian distance runner. You know, I mean, it's we, most people are gen- not genetically built for that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So that's what we talk about in terms of exercise. It's the right kind of exercise done at the right kind of... It's much more complicated than that, as you can imagine. But those yes. are the three, the, the idea. High intensity lifting, long walks, and brief sprints occasionally. Just so that you are ready to do that when you need to. Poised. Yeah. So that's exercise. Nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle said sleep and stress probably account for 20% of what our optimal gene expression. It sounds so straightforward when you break it down, doesn't it? Yeah, it's uh, simple, but it's not easy. Yeah, that was the next thing I was going to say. Is it? Yeah, yeah it, it's simple, but then it, it's, it's, as I listen to it, it's really taking a stand for yourself. Yeah. Um, and the, and being prepared to make changes and, and not just with yourself, but with the outside world as well to stand up. Look, all the information is out there on Google. Like yeah. Dr. Google has all of this. The problem is it's a fire hose, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah. There's just so much information coming from so many places that it's yeah. all, because it's overwhelming, you get that analysis paralysis. Like, well, what do I do first? So the role of the coach, the, the role of the coach is to journey plan it, is to say, look, let's do... Let's prioritize the things that we're going to get, the maximum bang for our buck first. And we'll push down the hill the things that might become harder and harder, like lowering your alcohol intake. You know, it, it, al- alcohol is a, is a toxin to yeah. the body. I mean, I, I lost 38 kilos. Cl- plus one carcinogenic. Well, depend, depends. Again, <clears throat> the more complicated the question, the more likely yeah. the answer is it depends. <laughs> So it's dose dependent, yes. as, as Peter Atia would say. It's so what's the dose? Mm. Everything's toxic at a certain level, even oxygen. Yeah, and water. And water. So what's the dose? And do you have pathways to mitigate? Um, yeah. So, you know, if if you have a a binge on a Saturday night, go to the sauna on a Sunday morning. If you th- th- you've got a pathway then to repl- to replace to recuperate that. Mm. Um, but yeah, so some things are harder for people because they're, they're more programmed. I mean, you talked in your previous podcasts about programmed. Yeah. We've been programmed since the age of whatever, mm. the, the conventional wisdom, conventional, I mean, I had a big argument with my brother about this, on about statins, about the use of statins. And he was like, so what you're saying is, he said, most all doctors are wrong. And I was like, yeah, conventional wisdom would say to a doctor, well, this is what all other doctors think, so therefore it's, I'm safe thinking this. Yep. And they don't actually question the, the wisdom and what the primal, what primal health teach, what the primal health culture has t- co- course has taught me is to question conventional wisdom. And because I'm a marketing guy, I'm always looking for between the lines, looking at the 
is this, am I being cynical or sceptical? Sometimes there's a fine line, mm. but what's in it? What, what's in it for the other person? What, what's really behind the message? And we have been programmed by big pharma, big manufacturing, big food, to believe certain things about um, what that are optimal for us to be healthy. Yeah, you know, five fruit and veg a day, whole grains, vegetable oil, sugar, energy balance. You know, it's all nonsense. It's all absolute BS because it suits their shareholders. It doesn't suit us as humans. It suits the sick care industry, not the healthcare industry. Doctors don't prevent health disasters these days. They just prescribe. A doctor, the average doctor. Learned, learned about four hours worth of nutrition from an, from people who believe that whole yeah. grains are healthy for you. Mm. And so that if they know anything about nutrition, they know the wrong thing. They'll, they, they'll believe that eating dietary fat causes cardiovascular disease. So avoid eating fat, which was what most doctors were told from the 1970s, that cholesterol kills. It's just absolute nonsense. It's absolute BS. Now, there are a lot of woke doctors the, these days. You're not the first podcast guest to... There are, there, there are a lot of woke doctors around, and I'm not going to... Woke doctors. I'm not gonna, yeah, that, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to denigrate all doctors. You know, but yeah, my, my dad was diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes and told to stop eating fat. And it altered his brain. He, he started to... He, he start, I can only call it Tourette's. But he started to have, like, speech patterns that were just showed a neurological chemical imbalance in his head hmm. and his doctor said he's, he's still eating too much and the guy the guy was an ex it was an it was a treaty it was a like a plasterer and he had used to when i grew up he had huge four he was like popeye and his arms got skinnier and his legs got skinnier and he still had this big pot belly and the doctor kept saying something wrong with you it was a tumor the size of a grapefruit it wasn't his cholesterol hmm. and it was like it's like not, now not all doctors are going to miss that kind of thing but the first thing was oh you've got high cholesterol that's what's going to kill you no you know, st uh, stop eating fat no you know it, it's just there are so many conventional wisdom is killing people old ways of programming avoiding yeah. avoiding saturated fats and monounsaturated fats at the expense of guzzling down vegetable oil and, and eating processed foods that contain both vegetable oil and sugar, and added sugar, 20 different kinds of sugar, hidden. Because if it had all, just sugar, it would be the number two ingredient, probably after vegetable oil. Mm. Um, the, the industry has ways of hiding this thing and, and confusing people. Mm. And this is the shame and the anger that I, was that I talked about earlier. Now so, to feel it so when you walk into a supermarket, if you go to the grocery section, fine. You go to the butchers and the fishmongers, fine. Then you go through to the, the, the where all the toiletries and chemicals are and you need, hopefully, environmentally friendly cleaning products. The rest of it, the freezer's full of ice cream. Anything that comes in a packet, read, 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 read the labels. Don't just glance at them. I went to buy some tomato juice the other day. 20% sugar, added sugar. Just an average supermarket tomato juice. You wouldn't think that there was added sugar in tomato juice. It's like, oh, what? There's just it's just full of preservatives and colours and it, they may say it's all natural. It, it it's original, you know, original derivative of was probably natural, but what's being done to it isn't natural. You know, the process for making vegetable oil scares me. When it, I mean, I have conversations with chefs about this. It's like. Why are you using vegetable oil, canola oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, rice oil, bran oil? You know, why are you using this stuff? Don't include olive oil. No, no, no. Well, the olive oil yeah. is different. So they, 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 most people would class plant oils, would class avocado oil and coconut oil and olive oil within plant oils. But there's a big difference between the oil of a fruit and the oil of a seed. And seed oil, to make seed oil look golden in a nice, in a nice bottle has to be bleached, has to be dissolved, and has to be pressed under high heat. It, it's liquid margarine. It's, it's like a molecule away from plastic. It's, to <laughs> it's totally synthetic. And it's not just bad for you from a calorific point of view and from an omega-6 imbalanced point of view. 
It's bad for you because when you heat it, it changes its chemical consistency, its chemical formula. They change to contain trans fats and aldehydes. You know, we, we preserve stuff in formaldehyde and it's mm. extremely toxic. We're cooking at high temperature stuff in, in products that were created um, by accident and then, but, well, so, so vegetable oils were created because whale oil was expensive. So we used to light lamps with it. And it's like, oh, but we can eat it as well. Oh, it doesn't seem to do people much harm because it's not poisonous at the doses they were eating it. So it was grandfathered by the FDA. Oh yeah, vegetable oil is fine. It was never tested. It was never, it, there was no clinical trial, long-term clinical trial on the harm. Mm. So it was just, it was, it's just there on the shelves. If it's there on the shelves, it must be safe. That's what we all. That's that's the programming. If it's on the shelf, it must be safe. They they they, they wouldn't sell us stuff that was harmful for us. Would they? they? But, but they do. Hmm. As long as they sell. Tobacco as long as they sell. As long as they're shareholders. Mm. Yeah. And you saw vegetable oils. Well, tobacco with burners. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, vegetable oils, um, grains, all grains. So that's not just wheat germ. It's you know, rice and corn too, they're, they're not optimal for human nutrition. Um, and sugar, you know, it's, it's sugar that, that is predominantly behind cardiovascular disease and, uh, and it probably uh, the inflammation that it causes through things like um, Alzheimer's and dementia. So, it's, it's, it, so that's why I'm angry and I'm ashamed mm. about the marketing industry. We found ways to fool people and to program people that saturated fat's bad, vegetable oil's good. Mm. That, um, and that, this is just... That cornflakes are a healthy breakfast. And this is just food. This is just food. Yeah, not, not, not the other yeah. lifestyle stuff. Yeah. I like the... Um, was it the Romans or the Greeks who would pay their doctors only when they were well? Yeah, um, it, I think it was um, Hipp Hippocrates who said all disease starts in the gut. Yeah, yeah, and th that's and and it it is to a certain degree true. What we what we digest and absorb, we are what we digest and absorb. We are what we eat eats. And I haven't even talked about gut health and. Mm. intestinal permeability and biomes and micro and the microbiome mm. uh, we've had a previous guest talk about the gut biome yeah i i, I know i listened to that it, it's new science yeah it, it is it is new science so the, the the there's a great book called uh wheat belly by dr william davis another one by dr david Palmer called um grain brain um, and the the secret to this the secret it's no secret anymore the gut is connected to the brain through the vagus nerve hmm. and the stuff that we eat and that is produced as a side effect of what we eat so the microbiome the, the, the short chain fatty acids that the microbiome produce feed us the ketones that they produce feed us and it goes and it travels directly through the vagus nerve to the brain um, there's, I think, s some Scandinavian scientists <clears throat> did, an, did an experiment where they cut the vagus nerve in some people who had a, a, a genetic predisposition to Parkinson's. And those people who had their vagus nerve cut were 50% less likely to, have, to, to, um, to get Parkinson's. So Parkinson's. So, 50% that means that Parkinson's is coming from something in the gut hmm. through the vagus nerve hmm. the neuro neurotransmitters something's something's not working there something's wrong yeah so we, we I, I think the, the whole microbiome thing is still on charted territory I still because we don't know what the bug you know how many of which bugs we should have for our genetic makeup so yeah. what, what's good microbiome for the Hadza tribe in Africa isn't necessarily the same what's good for the Inuit in um, in 
in the Arctic isn't good for a tribe of pygmies in South America. So, and so you and us as mongrels, you know, uh, uh, people who've grown up in Europe from people who, from all over the world, you know, from, from yeah. Scandinavia and from Eastern Europe and, and from Southern Europe, you know, we have such a, a unique, each of us has such a unique genetic makeup that it's hard, it's hard to say what's good and what's bad from a microbiome point of view. But having a healthy microbiome, no matter where you're from, is really important. Having a microbiome that doesn't leak into your blood system through intestinal, intestinal permeability is really important. Mm. So not eating things that open up the tight junctions and leak the stuff that's in your gut into your bloodstream. That's really important, no matter where you're from. What, have you, what has Nick learned about Nick through this journey of recent? Um, that's a that's a really interesting question. What have I learned about myself? Um, that I am able to absorb and communicate a fire hose of information drip by drip if I'm required to do so. So I can pull back, I can stop nerding out, I can help people if they are wanting to change. And what does that give you? Legacy. Mm. Legacy has always been greater than currency as far as I'm concerned. I've never been motivated by money. I'll always be poor. Except because if I've got money in my pocket, I'll spend it on... <laughs> you don't know if you're going to get hit by a bus or hit by you know, a massive stroke. Um, the, lie, the lie that society tells us about planning for our retirement, planning is just... Is is a is a it's a Ponzi scheme. Mm. So um, be more dog. Don't don't worry about the past. You can't change it. Be more dog. Yeah, dogs dogs just live in the moment. Mm. Dogs just live in the moment. You know, dogs don't suffer from anxiety and depression. Not unless they've been really badly treated. They're like, oh, yeah, you're gonna pat me. You're gonna give me food. Yeah, well, I'll just wag my tail. Just be more dog. Just live for the moment. You know, my dog taught me more about me than I thought was possible. You know, it made me a better parent. Learning about my four-legged four-year-old <laughs> and, and how to bring happiness to that four-legged four-year-old actually made me a better dad. Because it, it gave, me, gave me patience, discipline, empathy, Gave, gave me all those things that, that, you know, being a dad and being overwhelmed with the dad stuff, you know, nobody teaches you that. Um, but actually th taking a step back and thinking about the psychology and the physiology and uh, the nature of the child or the dog. It, that, that taught me a lot about myself, no. actually, that I, that I could change, that I could be more empathetic, that I could be more patient. Mm. that I could be more objective uh, outside of the moment looking in rather than just living in it but yeah be more dog was it um, taught you about your identity given that you know in the course of this conversation we've listened to a quite a large identity shift uh, yeah you're right yeah, so I've always identified I, I am Nick I am an ad man yeah and now you are. But I am um, Nick. I will one day no longer be an ad man. I, I don't identify 100% as a health coach, but I identify 100% as somebody who wants people to take charge of their health. Hmm. So for me, it's process. It's, there is no one big objective. It's just like, this is a process. This is a journey. This is like helping people to get, you know, to be the best that they can be. And I've walked the walk, and I now have the skills to talk the talk. Yeah. 
Um, From all the places you wouldn't have normally expected. No, yeah, it's like, yeah, how many admin turn? It's, it's funny, you know, my, my ex-wife was a nurse and became a teacher. And being, you know, in the corporate game and being in business, they felt like worlds apart. Um, and at a young age, they were worlds apart. But now as I'm in my later years, legacy, exit strategy, what people will say about me at my funeral actually really matters. What my kids will remember about me really matters. So, so it's now time to do something that matters. Mm. It's like considering of your own mortality. Yeah. Memento mori. One day I will die. Yeah. Kind of pulls away all the bullshit, really, doesn't it? And all the lies that you kind of tell yourself. Yeah, I mean, you know, the name of the podcast is WA Real. Yeah. So it's like, it's time to wake up and, and smell the coffee and be real. It's like, stop hiding behind that corporate suit. Yeah. Stop, you know, trying to climb a ladder that's not worth climbing. <clears throat> Be open, frank, authentic, care, and honest. Hmm. Understand what your values are and align to them. Yeah, and, and under, yeah, understand what you're not. I mean, I haven't reached the outside of the envelope yet. Cause I was saying to you earlier, it's like, so if somebody says, "Do you fancy doing some stand-up comedy?" I'm the guy who'll put my hand up. You know, it's like because it's like, oh, yeah, I've not tried that before. Hmm. Um. So it's like, so I've, I've come this far. What else can I learn? But I'd, but I'd be learning, but I, it wouldn't change the purpose. It wouldn't change the, the vision, which is helping as many people as possible take charge of their health yes. through through wakening them up to the lies that industry and governments are, have been telling for so long that we now believe it's conventional wisdom when it's absolutely opposite of conventional, of, of wisdom. It's inverted wisdom. It is inverted. Yeah, it's it's unconventional wisdom will save us. Going back to where we came from will save us. Living our lives as our great great grandparents did, from a lifestyle point of view, from a what matters point of view. I think the kids of today have got a great opportunity because they're more about environmentally work. I think they're more community work. They're less bothered about possessions about buying stuff just to show stuff off. Mm. This whole sharing, um, this whole sharing, renting, experiencing thing, it's more dog. Right? They're not bothered about having a mortgage. You know, there are some people who are stupid, parents are still telling them, you know, you need to get a good job, you need to get a mortgage, you need to get a good education, you need to spend $200,000 on university. But there are more and more kids who are actually, you know, that I, when I talk to them, I'll, I'll, I, I say, why are you going to university? Do you really want to go to university? It's expected of them. Mm. It's kind of they're on the, in the sausage factory. I blame Tony Blair. I had this conversation before with other people. It's like education, 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 he said in 1997. Sure you remember. He did, didn't he? And he built up an industrial education complex mm. that needed more and more sausages to be made, but with less and less people to eat them. So when I went to university, when you went to university, we were really lucky. Mm. You know, so we got grants and it's state paid for it. State paid for it. Um, whatever background you came from, whichever university you went to, but there were limited places. If you could get in, if you could get in, there were limited places. Otherwise, you went to polytechnic. And scarcity meant that there were people. There were just there were, let's say, twenty thousand graduates. There were jobs for twenty thousand graduates. There, there was no there was no reason for the government to sponsor people if there weren't jobs there. The jobs were there. The demand was there. It's basic economic supply and demand. Mm. We've got we've got this many jobs that need bright kids, and he said, hey, "Let everybody have an, a degree here. It's like opera. You have a degree. You have a degree. You have a degree." Yeah. And there's like, "Yeah," and there's jobs in McDonald's, and they're like, well, "I've got a degree." I'm like, "Yeah, but you know, all the best jobs have already been taken by the people who got firsts." <laughs> yeah, and uh, so he created an expectation of 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 happy times, of middle class bliss, of mortgages, and w without the actual economics behind it, without mm. the demand behind it. And that's well, just continued. right down the rabbit hole. And that's it, continued you know, and continued and continued. Right down the rabbit hole. There's, um, you know, the, the sale 
the sale of the concept of home ownership helps to tie you into a mortgage, which yep. makes you, yep. let's not dress it up like it's not an economic slave, yep. and then buy the selling of a degree. And that was Thatcherism. Yeah, and the selling of a degree just brings that even closer. So yeah. before you even decide to buy the house, you're already in it. Yeah. I, um, and then they got you with the debt. <laughs> and, then the, and then they've got you. They've got you. They've got the hook in. They've got the hook in, and then it's and then you're on. Then you're the rat on on the treadmill. What does the next three to five years look like for now? If if I'm going to achieve the mission to to help as many people who want to be helped got to do what the other people like me are doing which is get out to the masses mm. it's like one on one's great and if I can change one person's life and that's my legacy that's fine you win. I'm happy with that I win but if I can change a thousand or ten thousand like Mark Sisson has or a million or be part of his program to change a hundred million lives or a thousand million lives got to get on TV got to you got to be speaking to more people more often for the reprogramming to happen. Because mm. we've had 30, 40 years of the, of, of the industrial advertising complex programming us, programming people, programming our parents and our children into conventional wisdom, programming doctors and teachers into conventional wisdom. It's, it, you know, so I, started, I started off listening to Chef Pete Evans thinking of him as a chef who knew something about nutrition. And now look at Chef Pete Evans as an inspiring individual who is actually a health coach, who uses his platform as a chef to waken people the F up. Hmm. Now, some people get it, some people won't. Some people keep slapping on the sunscreen and all those phytoestrogens will be feminizing their gonads. Um, and some people will listen and you know, I want to be on Pete's team I want to be on Mark Sisson's team I want to be on the team that was right historically and that's that's hopefully going to be you know so the next three to five years got to be famous for talking this kind of stuff mm. and, and, and sharing this passion this mm. sacrifice because mm. changing requires sacrifice because it's, it's staying the same requires no effort at all. It, and that won't help society. That won't reduce the burden of pain in society. So somebody's got to put their hand up. Why not me? I do comedy. <laughs> ah. What... Um... You, you obviously take on board a lot of information and you're you know, drinking from the fire hose regularly. What do you do to keep yourself grounded and leveled out? Dog. Dog, yeah. Wife. Yeah, good earthing wrong. Walk on the beach. Nice gin and soda. Good quality food. Good quality food, not in excess. Um, I read. Um, I I, I am so selective in what I watch on TV these days. It's like, mm. it's, I watch any, pretty much any kind of sport because there's a drama that, without a script. <laughs> um, but reality TV bores me. There are certain traditional kind of stuff, like soap operas that I kind of just watch just because the characters have been part of my life for such a long time, but they get fewer and fewer. Um, I spend more of my time... I spent a lot of time recently studying. Mm -hmm. um, spend quite a lot of time listening to podcasts. Um, um, I long to preempt the question there. What keeps me grounded? The little things in life. Yeah. My kids, my dog, my wife, my family, my friends. A football team. Yeah, you cannot be ground. You cannot be grounded. It. You cannot be any more grounded than a Leeds United fan. <laughs> <laughs> so that keeps it real. Yeah, Leeds United. Yeah, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> <laughs> for health or football. It's not. No. 
Um, the last question that I like to ask guests with is if you could take a little nugget and upload it into the collective consciousness so everybody just gets it what would that be so I, I have one but I'm, I'm going to go through the process so at least this is my working out go on. so this is a similar to question to one that I've heard Tim Ferriss ask which is if you had a billboard you put a message on a billboard what would the billboard say and I always remember Wim Hof saying breathe motherfucker <laughs> Right. And it's like so simple. And uh, Jocko Willink said, discipline is freedom. Yeah. Right. So again, it's a really easy mantra to remember. And I was thinking, what would be what would be my mantra? And um, one of the first posts I did when I started the agency, and this was about marketing and marketing, what comes from the Royal Society. It's the motto of the Royal Society, which is nullius in verba, which literally means take no one's word for it. So there, are, there are a lot of people outside, and, and I'm included. Here I am speaking to you, trying to influence the way you think. Don't just take my word for it. Yeah. Don't, don't have, no, have no false gods. You know, a, a guy in the sauna the other day talking about Graham Hancock. And I'm like, yeah? Aliens? Really? Are there anybody else writing about this stuff? No? Okay, just you then. Yeah, but if, if there is... If there is enough people talking about the same things, hmm. patterns start to emerge. Reason. And it's like, yeah, but he said that, and he said that, and he said the same thing. Maybe there's something in that. Hmm. But if one person says it, uh, do your reference checking. So nullius in verba, take no one's, no one person's word for it, whatever hmm. that it is. It's been absolutely awesome talking to you today, mate. Ditto, mate. I've super, super enjoyed it. And, you know, one of the biggest themes that comes out of it is if your health, you're responsible for it. Yeah. At the moment you... I've often thought about how we abdicate responsibility to GPs, drugs, big pharma, hospitals and stuff like that. You're taking it to a level deeper for me today with conventional wisdom and what's been peddled. Another one of my famous quotes. Bill Parcells, ex-coach of the New York Giants. Mm. Blame no one, expect nothing, do something. Say that again. Blame no one, expect nothing, do something. something. And it's about personal responsibility. Yeah. It's like, you're not entitled to anything. You, mm. If you can make the change, yeah, it is about person about, and then having the information and the support and da 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 da. But mm. you've got to want to change. Yeah, for the better. I mean, last week's guest, completely different. Oh yeah, listen to that. So you are the center of your reality. Yep. Yeah. Technically, there's no difference. No. And that's what comes up again and again and again and again. Whether it's the two guys who took control of the direction of where Bayswater's going because they thought somebody in the council was thinking about where Bayswater was going and they realised that nobody was. Whether you have somebody who sits, stands up for citizens' rights because they had a hospital experience where they thought that the patient would be at the centre of the experience. It turns out there's not. Whether it's this or that or the other people suddenly awaken to the fact that oh all the stuff that I thought I could rely on might not quite have me at the centre of processing me but yeah but you're the centre of your reality you're the centre of your experience live it be there take responsibility for it can't disagree with you somebody wants to get hold of you Nick where can they find you? Uh, Nick Eggleton. Uh, <laughs> I, I, the other Nick Eggletons in the world must hate me. Um, <laughs> so I'm at Nick Eggleton on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, Nick Eggleton at Gmail. <laughs> I can't, I get, as soon as something comes out, you know, you'll find me on TikTok. I'm, I'm there. Um, yeah. As far as Gene Life's concerned, it's genelife.com.au. Yeah. Um, Gene Life. 
underscore AU on Instagram and Twitter. Um, but Gene Life, yeah. Didn't explain Gene Life, did I? But I think I have explained it. You did without. You, you did. Genetics for life. Yeah. <laughs> or genetics for living. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for telling it.